Within yourself lies the cause of whatever enters into your life. To come into the full realization of your own awakened interior powers is to be able to condition your life in exact accord with what you have done. That's Ralph Waldo Trine. And up for today's discussion is Ralph Waldo Trine's In Tune with the Infinite. Now, before we begin to consider this primary source, we need to take some time to really consider what type of key questions were to ask of these type of sources. So thinking about the scope of the semester, it might be valuable to begin by presenting a number of questions that you should employ in each source you're asked to read this semester. So no matter the source, we should be asking questions like, how is the prosperity gospel constructed in this course? Or you might ask, how are ideas of faith, health, wealth, and victory emerging or defined in this source? You might even ask, how does faith produce such things as health, wealth, and victory? A few other questions you might ask, how are these sources influenced by their historical context? What is the theological and historical impact of these sources? How is this source related to trends and themes found in American culture or contemporary iterations of the prosperity gospel? And finally, how is this source related to the other sources we've read throughout the course? Now, these are not necessarily questions for course discussion, but they are foundational questions that we need to ask together throughout the semester. And so for the remainder of this video, I want to take the time to build out the historical context of Trine's In Tune with the Infinite, while providing a brief overview of the general themes present, offering us a starting place for our discussion. Ralph Waldo Trine was born in 1866 in Northern Illinois. Trine grew up and established his early career in the Reconstruction Era and a period which many historians call the Gilded Age. Each term describes the tumultuous years between the Civil War and the turn of the 20th century. Trine saw an American nation wrestle with the realities of a nation divided over the issues of race and the end of slavery. Meanwhile, America became more prosperous and saw unprecedented growth in industrialization and technology. He saw the settling of the West and the removal of native peoples, the expansion of manifest destiny, and emerging challenges to long-held religious belief and practice. And by the publication of the first edition of In Tune with the Infinite in 1897, America had become nearly fully industrialized. The Western frontier was closed and corrupt industrialists, bankers, and politicians enjoyed extraordinary wealth and opulence at the expense of the working class. And so the gap between rich and poor expanded, and the march of industrial progress and emergence of Darwinism, not only as a biological study, but as a social theory, it challenged religious belief, which brings me to a discussion question that I'd like you to answer this week. How does Trine's In Tune with the Infinite make sense of the gaps between the rich and the poor, set within the context of this emerging social Darwinism? So to state that question again, how does Trine's In Tune with the Infinite make sense of the gaps between the rich and the poor, especially within the context of an emerging social Darwinism? And here I'm thinking about the, the poor's perceived failure to rid themselves of stagnant emotions and thoughts which were believed to block healthy transmissions from the divine. And I kind of want to follow that up by asking another question. Is, does Trine's theology make accommodations for changing cultural belief? So it's in this context that Ralph Waldo Trine and then later Russell Conwell made their contributions. Trine became an influential early thought writer and early pioneer of the New Thought Movement, 
an intellectual and religious movement that attempted to recover ancient wisdom regarding the interaction between thought, belief, consciousness, and the effects within and beyond the human mind. Trines In Tune with the Infinite sold over 2 million English copies and has been translated into nearly 20 different languages. And who was Trine writing to? Like, who did he believe would pick up this book and read it? Well, Trine targeted the Christian everyman, careful to use Christian language and concepts that didn't appear outside of the Protestant mainstream. Trine sought to create a path to prosperity that appeared compatible with Christianity. And he's aware that even still, his philosophy, baptized in Christian language, had the possibility of criticism. However, Trine understands that such criticism is naturally to someone closed off from this prosperity-giving channel within. Uh, He actually makes the statement, he says, far more amusing is the man who voluntarily closes himself to truth because it does not come through the traditional or orthodox or heretofore accepted channels or because it may not be in full accord with, or may be opposed to, established usages or beliefs. The one who recognized the truth of his work was like, quote, a prisoner released from bondage. So, readers across the world were offered the opportunity to tap into trying secret knowledge, a confidence in the power of the mind and its corresponding ability to access divine sources. Trine implored readers to see themselves as channels of divine energy and learn to be ready vessels for divine flow. Now, stagnant emotions and thoughts, they blocked these healthy transmissions, leading to misery and disease. And right thinking, on the other hand, would open up the floodgates to abundant life. Trine always leaned on self-actualization. He insisted that any person could spiritually align themselves with happiness, health, and fortune. Spiritual forces could reach into the material world and right any wrongs as long as humans did their part in opening the pathways. So finally, consider consider these lines from Trine. See yourself in a prosperous condition. Affirm that you will before long be in a prosperous condition. You thus make yourself a magnet to attract the things you desire. Everything, every thought you entertain is a force that goes out, and every thought comes back laden with its kind, right? Remember, we talked about this type of boomerang theology. He continues, This is an immutable law. Every thought you entertain has, moreover, a direct effect upon your body. Love and its kindred emotions are the normal and the natural, those in accordance with the eternal order of the universe, for God is love. These have a life-giving, health-engendering influence upon your body, besides beautifying your countenance, enriching your voice, and making you ever more attractive in every way. You're then continually building this into both your mental and your physical life, and so your life is enriched by its influence. This was written in 1897. Where do you hear and see this sentiment today? Well, let's dive on into our discussion.